Hello, and welcome to another episode of Virtual Legality. I'm your host, Richard Hogue, managing member of the Hogue Law Business Law Firm of Northville, Michigan. And today we are talking about the 90s movie Hackers, starring Angelina Jolie and some other guy that I don't know ever made it in movies. Nah, nah, we're not talking about that. We are talking once again about The Last of Us leaks. And if you aren't familiar with this story, I will try to do this summary in as short a form as possible. But suffice it to say, The Last of Us Part 2 is coming out next month, a couple weeks back. Almost all of its cutscenes, a lot of screenshots, a bunch of material from the game wound up getting leaked out. And who did it and why has been one of the constant kind of questions related to this whole thing. When the leak actually happened, there was a Reddit post, obviously anonymous, unsourced, that suggested the leak happened because some Naughty Dog employees, or at least one employee, was upset about working conditions at the studio. This dovetailed with a lot of reporting that had been done about Naughty Dog in the past couple of years, and so was naturally something that the internet was inclined to believe. However, Sony has since come out with some statements which we are going to review and look at that has suggested that that is not in fact the case. Suggested being the operative word there. They don't exactly say what's going on. Certain assumptions are being made on the opposite side of this question, And I think they're very interesting. If you're not familiar with virtual legality or aren't familiar with this channel outside of this series on The Last of Us Leaks, one of the things we talk about a lot is corporate messaging. As a lawyer, one of the things I am constantly asked to do is vet public statements, websites, how things look, what they are saying, because for the most part, and some companies are definitely not abiding by this rule, but for the most part, you can't lie. You don't want to lie to your consumers. You don't want to lie to your contract partners. You don't want to lie to the public at large because there is liability that can be attached to those acts. So for the most part, corporations, especially giant multinational corporations, don't lie, can't lie. There are exceptions to every rule. You see them in the news all the time. But the reason you see them in the news is because they're getting sued and they are liable for their lies. So... A good lawyer, a good internal general counsel or outside law firm will tell their corporate clients, no, you can't lie, but that's not the end of the story. So we're going to start out with a tweet that I received from Joseph LaRussa at Joseph LaRussa. This is the name you've seen on this channel before. What can I say? He asks good questions. He says, hey, Hogue, I've seen a fair amount of people speculating that Sony may have lied slash be lying regarding The Last of Us Part 2 leaks. Some people are arguing Sony is saying it was an outside hack to cover up their work culture issues. Possible fifth video, I think we're now on sixth, but it was fifth at the time, explaining the futility of lying like that. And so the question we're going to answer, we're going to talk about here in this space about business and law is why Sony can't be lying or really shouldn't be lying. Anybody can lie, and hey, that would be quite the news story later on if they turned out to be lying, but very likely isn't lying, and how that still isn't the end of the story. As you saw in the thumbnail that you clicked on to get to this video, I described Sony's storytelling here as leaky. It is not very solid. Although certain assumptions are being made, those assumptions aren't borne out by what Sony has actually said. However, what they have said is not entirely full of holes because I think as a corporate lawyer myself, and how you should read corporate statements is assume they are true, but assume that that truth value in the statement doesn't have to tell the whole story. So thank you, Mr. LaRusso. We're going to look at this issue right now. I've pulled up the Polygon article that has the best kind of formatting for Sony's original statement where they say, as of May 1st, Sony says it knows who leaked The Last of Us Part Two. It was an outside party. Now, that headline and corporate lawyers and corporations that put out statements know that this kind of thing happens is a paraphrase of what they said in a way that assumes certain things that weren't actually said. This is doing the work for the corporation for them. Sony says things about who is responsible that can be read to assume that they know who leaked it, and they probably do now, weeks after the fact, but their statement doesn't actually say that. So we're going to look at the statement. We're also going to look at the add-on statement that they made to Kotaku was the place that I found their add-on here. And then we're going to talk a little bit about why they can't lie or why they shouldn't lie in order to avoid liability and why that's not the end of the story. So here's their statement on this particular issue. 
SIE, Sony Interactive Entertainment, has identified the primary individuals responsible for the unauthorized release of The Last of Us Part Two assets. They are not affiliated with Naughty Dog, the developer, or SIE. We are unable to comment further because the information is subject to an ongoing investigation. We're looking forward to when The Last of Us Part Two will be in your hands and can't wait for you to enjoy the full experience on June 19th. I love it. You got to get the marketers in there at the end, right? And before we look at their add-on statement, another thing I want to add here is this is multi-millions of dollars at issue. This was vetted by lawyers. This was looked at by counsel. It might have been looked at by multiple counsel, in-house, outside. A lot of folks put eyes on a statement like this that is going to go out to the media to discuss this massive leak that has come out of their biggest game of the year. So when you look at these kinds of things, it's easy to put the tinfoil hat on and it's easy to tell people to take it off because they're conspiracy conspiracy theorists. But don't just skip the notion that this actually has been vetted. These words were carefully selected to be truthful while also protecting whatever interests that Sony or whatever corporation you might be reading about might otherwise want to be protecting. So lawyers looked at this. This is carefully thought out. They then added on the following because some people were saying, whoa, there are holes in that statement, holes that we're going to talk about. And so they wound up clarifying. A spokesperson for Sony clarified in an email to Kotaku that the leakers were not former employees or contractors of either Sony or Naughty Dog. Now, there's a couple of assumptions in that statement as well. And just like we talked about with respect to the headline, this is a paraphrase. They didn't actually put the actual email that Sony sent to them here. And so when you see a phrase like the leakers, that is designed to tie into what they read in the original statement as being the leakers, right? But that's not actually what Sony has said. And so that's going to be part of this story. But before we get into that, I do want to say the reason that this question was asked of me is for me to discuss why Sony isn't likely lying. And so I want to talk about that at the front end. First of all, Sony is a publicly traded company. I pulled up their investor relations screen here. It says Sony shares are listed in the form of so- Sony ordinary shares, what we might consider common stock, on the Tokyo Stock Exchange. In the United States, Sony shares are listed on the New York Stock Exchange in the form of depository receipts under the ticker symbol SNE. So you can work with the Tokyo Stock Exchange by buying things on the New York Stock Exchange. Suffice it to say, Sony is public. They're organized under the laws of Japan. They are available on the Tokyo Stock Exchange. Those laws don't exactly match up with United States securities laws, securities being the name for things like stocks and bonds that are otherwise sold in public markets. And so that the United States and other jurisdictions are worried about making sure that they are sold above board and following all the rules and regulations. But suffice it to say, Sony is a public company. And as a public company, a multinational public company, they have certain obligations to disclose information about how they operate. I've pulled up now a Practical Law article. Practical Law is a great resource. They are actually a pay subscription. This isn't from their pay subscription service. I wouldn't put that up on my channel. This is actually from the author's website, White and Case LLP. So this comes through them. But if you're not familiar with how these businesses operate or when you get information from these phone calls. The answer is that these public stock exchanges require certain information to be filed. Now, this is specifically about United States law. I'm not familiar with Japanese securities law. Most jurisdictions have certain things that dovetail with the generalities of international kind of stock exchanges, but this will give you a good kind of understanding of what's happening here. Under federal securities law, that's the United States law, Companies are not required to disclose their financial results for a completed fiscal period outside of the requirement to file an annual report, what we call Form 10-Ks and quarterly reports on Form 10-Qs. In practice, however, most reporting companies, companies that have this obligation to file this information, voluntarily release their earnings information before filing their annual reports. And many do so before filing their quarterly reports. Companies do this for a variety of reasons, including to respond to investors' demands for information and to enable the company 
and insiders who are aware of the information that's going to be on this report to trade in the company's securities, right? Insider trading is a bad word. And certainly we all think of it in kind of a negative space, but you're allowed as an insider at Sony or wherever to trade in the securities of that company, as long as you're not trading on information that the rest of the public doesn't have. So one of the ways to cure that is to have a phone call and say, here's all the information we know before our reporting actually has to be done so that the insiders can once again trade without violating any rules. That being said, there are issues with respect to any time as a public company, you have contact with investors, prospective investors, and other people that you might have interested in your securities. It says, when a reporting company issues an earnings release, it might file a Form 8K with the SEC that includes the text of the release. However, the information is considered furnished and the company does not have general liability. In practice, few companies choose to file their earnings releases or incorporate them by reference into the Securities Act registration statements since doing so potentially exposes them to that additional liability. So these earning calls aren't filed documents. They aren't a replacement 10Q. They aren't a replacement 10K. That being said, even with that as the background, you're not allowed to just lie. This last paragraph lays that clear. The general anti-fraud provisions of Section 10B and Rule 10B-5 under the Exchange Act, which prohibit material misstatements or omissions, you can't just skip things that are important, are applicable to earnings releases and earnings calls. So in other words, these companies go out there, they have certain requirements to not lie on the financial records that they are otherwise going to report to either Japan or the US, or wherever else they might have these obligations. In general, they have calls regarding those things before they are filed. I've pulled up now the investor relations page for Sony that shows that they had a call on May 13th or they have a call scheduled for tomorrow. As a matter of fact, that's May 13th tomorrow to talk about earnings and that these calls can otherwise get them in trouble if they lie. Rule 10b-5, which is one of the big rules in United States securities law, says it shall be unlawful for any person to employ a device scheme or artifice to defraud to make any untrue statement of a material fact or omit to state a material fact necessary in order to make the statements made in light of the circumstances under which they were made not misleading to engage in any act, practice, or course of business which operates or would operate as a fraud or deceit in connection with the purchase or sale of any security. You have earnings calls to help your secondary market, to help people have faith in your company so that you can either raise capital in the future or otherwise just feel good about how the market views your company, which is a long way of saying when you make a public statement, when you issue a statement to Polygon, when you have any interaction that can tailor the market, that investors are going to read, are going to listen to, are going to think about, you have to be very careful to not defraud to not make a material misstatement of fact or to omit to make statements that might otherwise be read as important. So Sony is out there. Sony knows these rules. They have similar rules in Japan and they know that they have to make statements carefully. That's why you see statements that are so vetted. That's why if you follow the video game industry or maybe movies or television or really any other industry on the planet Earth, you don't necessarily get the information that you want to get out of those communications because they are so carefully manicured. But the reason they are that carefully manicured is that they have liability, a public company especially, for making material misstatements. And so everything here has to be basically true, even though as we will see, the statements that are read this way by the media by the gaming media or any other kind of journalism in any other industry don't necessarily have to relate specifically to what they said because Sony can always go back and say, that's not what we said. I understand how it was reported and hey, maybe we intended it to be reported that way, but that is not what we said. Another consideration is that when we talk about this particular issue, Sony says that they've identified the individuals responsible. They're not affiliated with Naughty Dog or Sony If they wind up suing this individual or individuals, it's going to come out in the wash anyway. I've pulled up a random article about a lawsuit, Nintendo wins lawsuit against California man who allegedly sold Nintendo Switch mods and pirated games. 
It says, back in January 2018, a hacking group named as Team Executor announced a Nintendo Switch hack that would allow people to play pirated games. It didn't take long for Nintendo to catch wind of this, so in December 2018, they filed a lawsuit against a California man and other unnamed defendants. The California man was eventually revealed to be Sergio Mojaro Moreno. Said another way, this person was identified. And when that person is identified, any investigative journalist, any gaming journalist, any journalist at all can go and look at their background, can go and look and see if they appeared in the credits of a Naughty Dog game or any other Sony game or anywhere else at Sony. And so when you start talking about, is Sony lying here? The answer is almost certainly no. But the game in corporate law and in corporate statements and in corporate messaging, when you've got a potential legal action slash liability, is to figure out what they're not saying, what you can read into the statements that they are making. That's the fun of it for a corporate lawyer, especially. And if you find yourself in virtual legality, probably for you as well, is to parse these things out. But Sony would be silly to just be flat out lying on this stuff. So the reason the game is fun is we can assume that this stuff is true, but that doesn't lead necessarily to the conclusion that so many of these places want it to lead to. So with that as our background, they're almost certainly not lying, but they may not be telling the full truth as long as their lawyers think that that not telling the full truth can skirt around 10b5 and whatever kind of analogous rules and regulations might otherwise apply in other jurisdictions. We can now look at what is happening here and parse it out. Now, you heard me talk about this statement in one of the videos in this Last of Us Leaks Legality series before, where we talked about how there were some funny things happening in here. But we're going to look at it a little bit deeper because there's also been some news items that have happened since that video. And I think it's interesting. I think it's, I think it's fun. So we start with the first sentence. SIE has identified the primary individuals responsible for the unauthorized release of TLOU2 assets. So what does that statement say? It says a couple of things. First of all, the word primary is doing a lot of work there. It implies that they have identified certain people, individuals being in the plural is also important, that they think are responsible, but maybe not everybody. And so primary is doing some work. Sony's not done with their investigation. And we can ask ourselves, what does that mean? What is a secondary individual? And if there are more individuals that have yet to be identified, what are you actually talking about? What are you describing? And what does it mean to be responsible? This is a question that I think a lot of places have elided. They've just gone right by to assume that that sentence says SIE has identified the leakers. Right, We saw that in what Kotaku paraphrased as Sony's continuing response. In an email to Kotaku, the leakers were not former employees. I'd be willing to bet my hat that what that email actually says is something along the lines of the individuals we just talked about in our previous statement were not X, Y, or Z. We're not former employees or contractors. We probably didn't use the word leakers because we didn't use the word leakers here. That being said... We understand that you're going to assume that we're talking about who actually did the leaking. And as a matter of fact, that's what you wind up doing. It says here in this Kotaku article, and we're going to read chunks of this because it's interesting and it gives a good background for what's happening right now. Hackers are likely responsible for The Last of Us Part 2 leak. Now note even in that headline, he's talking about responsibility for the leak. But he's not necessarily going to be talking about, as we shall see, the actual individual or individuals who leaked the materials, which seems by far the more important question. And as we'll see in this article, it's the one that Sony skips. Primary individuals responsible for unauthorized release doesn't actually lead you all the way to the water of these folks leaked it. What it does lead you to is these folks enabled the leaking. These folks opened the back door of the house and we don't quite know, or we're not saying in this statement, who the burglar is, but we can identify who unlocked the door. That's distinct, and that distinction is important. So as we look at this article, here's what was shared with Kotaku. It says, the details of the apparent hack were first shared on Twitter late Saturday night by a person going by the name Pixelbutts, 
who later elaborated over direct message about how the exploit was discovered. He declined to share his real name. So understand the state of play here. And I looked at this thread, I looked at this tweet string, and this is a gentleman or individual that came out and put a whole bunch of descriptions about what this leak is. And we're going to read that in the paragraph that follows this, but doesn't otherwise have any kind of reason to believe them. And as we've talked about in virtual legality in the past, you've got an article like this. You've got now an anonymous source. He declined to share his real name to give any reason why he would know this information. Presumably, and I don't mean to disparage Kotaku, but presumably their journalists can't verify that this is a thing. They're taking this on faith because it sounds right. But certainly the rumors of culture crunch issues sounded right to other corners of the internet. So now we're getting into a kind of fight about what sounds right with respect to this particular issue. So Pixel Butts, I'm not sure why he or she is getting more credit than other folks that might otherwise be commenting on this, except that they've told a story here that is pretty useful and sounds like something that could happen. He described a sequence of events that started in January. That's when, he says, a hacker group discovered a method for accessing the Amazon servers for Naughty Dog games using what was essentially password information included in the code for the studio's games, including 2011's Uncharted 3 and 2013's The Last of Us. Those games accessed the servers for multiplayer functionality, but apparently could also be used to fetch files stored there. The UC3 key got them UC3 development material, and UC2 keys did the same, but there was some Last of Us Part 1 content mixed into that Uncharted 3 server. It wasn't too much of a stretch to think that the Last of Us Part 1 server would have the Last of Us Part 2 material. Now that in of itself is interesting just looking at it because the Last of Us Part 1 server is one game removed from the Last of Us Part 2. I would think that this logic would flow better from Uncharted 4, which is in between those two games. But I'm not judging the accuracy of this. I am not the right person. Any corporate lawyer is probably not the right person to ask about the details of whether or not this actually functionally works. But it's worth noting that while this is a nice story, it doesn't actually explain who might have leaked the materials. Hacking the materials and leaking the materials are two separate questions. It also doesn't exactly jive with what is actually comprising the leaks. In this article from Kotaku, it says, while the leak also included gameplay footage, it's unclear if the hackers would have been able to obtain a playable build of the game as opposed to gameplay footage recorded by Naughty Dog and saved on the studio's servers. Now, every company is going to be different, every developer, every corporation, but it begs the question, why were you recording gameplay footage and saving it on the studio servers? And as part of that question, would you be doing that? Would you be doing that at all? It's one of the reasons I think a lot of folks on the internet say Sony is lying, which this video is not standing for. Sony is not lying, but it doesn't mean they're telling the whole truth either. As part of this article, you also see that not even Pixelbutts actually says that this hack is what caused the leak. This article says, what remains less clear is who carried out the leak and why. Remember what the headline is. Hackers are likely responsible. That uses the same language as Sony. Sony has identified the primary individuals responsible. But this same article is only talking about the responsibility for unlocking the back door. It isn't talking about who actually leaked this stuff. Pixelbutts actually says it's not his hacking group. Their circle is more just Naughty Dog enthusiasts that like development content from their games rather than malicious actors. So what do we actually know from this article? We don't know who leaked it. Pixelbutt says, don't believe what sounds like the juiciest story, even if it's what you want to hear. Sometimes it's really that boring hacker man exploiting a vulnerability created by the company's own games to gain internal access. But that's the tool that did the job, not the reason behind the leak. Said another way, if you want to, you want to put that tinfoil hat so squarely on your head, you could say, well, sure, Sony identified that this hack existed, that this key led to this server that led to these assets. But since they can't actually say, and Kotaku doesn't say, and Pixelbutts doesn't say, Jason Schreier doesn't say, as we'll see, Jason Schreier, who I've got an image here, because as we've talked about in virtual legality, has blocked me for reasons beyond my ken, says, after talking to two people with direct knowledge of how TLOU2 leaked, 
So if we assume the accuracy of the Kotaku article that this key led to these assets, how it got out, as well as some naughty dog employees, I have a good idea of what happened. Short version, hackers found a security vulnerability in a patch for an older naughty dog game and used it to get access to naughty dog servers. That jives with what Kotaku just reported. He then continues, I think the footage that leaked is from devs playing an early build. I haven't watched it. Most importantly, rumors of this being an active protest by a contractor whose pay was robbed are not true. Naughty Dog actually extended pay and healthcare benefits for contractors due to COVID. That's an interesting question. Jason doesn't appear to have more information about who did the leak here. So going to the next sentence and saying it is definitely not an active protest by a contractor or employee or whatever was leaked on Reddit that may or may not be accurate, it doesn't seem to get there. Right? I read these things very closely, and I have no doubt that Jason believes everything that he's saying here, but he's got contacts at Naughty Dog who are telling them that it wasn't an employee, but doesn't appear to have told them who it was. And then in the same breath, you've got his old outlet, and the only source we have on any of this saying, I don't actually think it was the group that opened the door for the leak. But once my group had those assets, they were an asset that were out in the wild, so anybody could have done it. Anybody including, but not limited to, people that worked at Naughty Dog or that worked at Sony. Or at least until we get to the second part of Sony's statement. They are not affiliated with Naughty Dog or Sony Interactive. Now this jumped out at me as I talked about earlier in the series because affiliate isn't a great word to use here. It doesn't mean employed. It doesn't mean contracted with. It might mean something broader. As a matter of fact, I think it's implied to mean broader. Affiliated just means having anything to do with on a kind of generalized basis, or it might mean something narrower. If we look at just a dictionary, a random one, affiliate is a person or organization officially attached to a larger body, someone that's officially attached to that body. So you say, okay, if they're not affiliated with Naughty Dog or Sony, are they affiliated with somebody else? Or since you use the verb are, Is that implying a present tense? Could it be that they were affiliated with Naughty Dog or Sony? And that's why when you get their clarification to Kotaku, they try to cover the past tense question. They clarified that the leakers were not former employees or contractors. But note that that isn't actually what they originally said. Former employees or contractors is not the same as affiliate necessarily. So we already have some kind of vagaries there. But also you have an open question from a corporate law standpoint, right? They are not affiliated with Naughty Dog or Sony, and they weren't employees or contractors of either Naughty Dog or Sony. But that's not really the end of the story, is it? Because video games take a lot of people, a lot of work. If we pull up the Uncharted 4 credit sequence, you can see multiple pages of what I'm showing you right now, which is outsourced work. And in this particular instance, from a corporate standpoint, Naughty Dog or Sony or whomever is kind of coordinating these things, hires another company that specializes in a specific thing or good. Here we are talking about art or outsourcing. They've also got sound and sound effects and voice recording outsourcing. In these credits, you can check them out. They're available online. But here we see that these people that are listed on this screen work for a company called Virtuos. And so... When we start to parse these statements out, if, say, uh, Julia Bianco, who works at Virtuos, turned out to be the leaker, and that's just for purposes of hypothetical, we have no reason to believe that Julia did anything wrong. But if we pretend that it is the case that she's the leaker, can we look at this statement and is it a lie? They are not affiliated with Naughty Dog or Sony Interactive Entertainment. Good lawyer would say, no, they're not. They're, I, they affiliate with Virtuos, who happened to sign a contract with Naughty Dog and Sony. But hey, that's not what we answered. Were they former employees or contractors of Sony or Naughty Dog? Now, here you got to parse it a little bit closer. They're not an employee. Were they a contractor? Was the managing director of Virtuos a contractor of Naughty Dog? Now, the corporate lawyer in me says, no. The way these contracts work is that Virtuos is the contractor and they put the bodies on the job that they've been given under the contract that are necessary to get whatever task they need to get done under the applicable statement of work. So if I'm being sneaky and somebody somewhere at one of these outside houses actually did do the leak 
I could make a statement that says they're not employees. They weren't contractors. They're not affiliated with us internally. But they might have worked on the game. Maybe. That's not stated anywhere. And just having Kotaku come out and say, we know who's responsible, while also saying what remains less clear is who carried out the leak and why, completely answers or fails to answer the fundamental question here, which is why was this done? So all of this debunking, all of this are not true from Mr. Schreier or anyone else seems to be a bridge too far, seems to be a step in logic that is one step farther than what Sony has actually put out there and what Pixel Butts or anybody else is actually claiming. So you wind up in a situation where people are now fighting on the internet about whether Sony is lying or not. And my answer is you don't even need to. Sony doesn't have to be lying about any of this to still potentially have a problem with internal culture on their hands. Yeah, the person in question might work for Virtuos or any other outsourced body that actually works on these things. But that doesn't mean that you don't have a problem with how you treat your contractors, how you treat those contracts. And so, yeah, they might not be personally responsible. They might not be somebody that actually reports into Naughty Dog or Sony Interactive Entertainment every day. But it doesn't necessarily mean that the leaker isn't someone that's affiliated with the actual production of The Last of Us Part Two. Finally, the last statement here, we, is, we are unable to comment further because the information is subject to an ongoing investigation. Now, that's interesting in and of itself, right? Sony is lending the belief that this was an outside hack. We've identified the primary individuals responsible. They aren't affiliated with us, and they are subject to an ongoing investigation. But again, reading between the lines, what's worthwhile to note here is they aren't actually talking about government and they don't actually relate the concept of an outside hack. If we look at other kind of instances of this happening, you can see what a release about this kind of thing looks like. I pulled up an Airbus statement. Airbus has been attacked by various cyber attacks throughout the last couple of years. And you see what they actually say. Airbus detected a cyber incident on Airbus commercial aircraft business information systems, which resulted in the unauthorized access to data. There is no impact on our commercial operations. This incident is being thoroughly investigated by Airbus experts who have taken immediate and appropriate actions to reinforce existing security measures and to mitigate potential impact, as well as to determine its origins. Investigations are ongoing to understand if any specific data was targeted. However, we do know some personal data was accessed. The company is in contact with the relevant regulatory authorities and the data protection authorities pursuant to the GDPR as a European company. Now, there's a bunch of things that aren't the same as when we talk about a video game leak happening here. This is actual industrial espionage of some kind where folks are trying to steal blueprints and whatnot. And whenever you've got personal information, personal data that was accessed, these statements have to come a little bit faster than otherwise. There are no indications as of yet that the Sony server access that appears to have clearly happened resulted in personal identifiable information being released into the wild. So Sony doesn't necessarily have to make a statement exactly like this. But it's worthwhile to note that Sony doesn't reference any kind of external investigation, doesn't reference cyber crimes, doesn't reference the FBI, doesn't reference government recommendations, just says is subject to an ongoing investigation. And in other places, this is actually referred to in other outlets as Sony's internal investigation. Now, it's always difficult to say, as we've already talked about, the parsing here is very easy for journalists, and I don't blame them, to make assumptions because they're not reading these things from a legal perspective. And so some of these outlets might be assuming that this refers only to a Sony internal investigation. And Sony actually meant to imply that the FBI was involved, cyber crimes, whoever else it might be, but they didn't imply that in this statement. All this basically says is we do think there was server access, Kotaku, Pixel Butts, whomever backs that up. The people that accessed it, the primary individuals responsible, aren't affiliated, but we want you to assume that we're talking about the leakers, and that's not necessarily the case, but we're still investigating. So are the leakers affiliated with the company? Maybe. If the primary individuals responsible are not necessarily the same as the leakers, then the second sentence actually doesn't affect the first in the way that you think it does. So maybe somebody at the company leaked it. But again, it's unlikely that Sony is trying specifically to lie about these things. And ultimately, 
the truth is very likely to come out on this question. At the end of the day, Sony is very likely to sue somebody. And so when they sue somebody on this, this is multi-millions of dollars that are potentially being lost as a result of this leak. Sony is very likely to sue somebody. And when they sue that person, when they sue that person, we'll have a little bit more information and we'll be able to reflect back on what they told us. And not only will we be able to reflect back on what they told us, we'll be able to better evaluate what they tell us in the future. This has been Virtual Legality for today. If you enjoyed this conversation, I'm having these conversations all the time. I've pulled up the page for The Last of Us Leak Legalities here. This is going to be the sixth entry into this series where we talk about all different facets as a jumping off point of all different parts and portions of corporate law just springing from this Last of Us Leak concept. I was brought here because I saw Sony doing DMCA takedown notices that didn't make a lot of sense to me. But as we've talked about all these various things, It's been a great conversation in this space, on Twitter and elsewhere, about all the things that kind of spring out from one of these kind of leak episodes, hopefully on something that isn't as important as an Airbus engine, and is, at the end of the day, simply video game cutscenes. So I think it's a great jumping off point if you're interested in any of these things. If you think anybody would be interested in any of these things, please like, subscribe, share this playlist around, share this video around. And if you caught this on YouTube, thank you so much for watching. And if you listen to it in its podcast form, thank you so much for listening. And I will catch you on the very next episode of Virtual Legality. Virtual Legality is a YouTube video series with audio podcast versions presented as commentary and for education and entertainment purposes only. It does not constitute legal advice and does not create an attorney-client relationship. If you have legal questions about the topics discussed, please consult your own legal counsel.